Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, God who at sundry or different times and in divers manners spake in time passing to the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, by whom he also made the worlds. And so we talked about last week that God has spoken throughout history in various covenants. Uh, we, we talked about the very first covenant being the Adamic covenant, or Adamic. You know, that's the word Adam with the I-C-O, so Adam, but you probably pronounce it Adamic um, covenant, where Adam you know, and Eve committed high treason in the Garden of Eden, and, and so God had to slay animals to cover their sin, and so the blood was shed, but you know, because animals were of a lower class, it could not um, wash their sin, it could simply cover it for a season. And then God moved into the uh, covenant that which we now stand in relationship with the Abrahamic covenant, the, God, the covenant God made with Abraham. And that covenant was fulfilled in the new covenant, Jesus Christ. Remember, he came in, in, in the lineage and line and the fulfillment of the uh, promise, not of the law, but of the promise. Hallelujah. And so God made a covenant with Abraham. And so we got into that in Genesis. We talked about the, Abraham, the, Adamic, the Adamic in Genesis 3.15. And then the Abrahamic, we, got, we get into, we start in about chapter 15 of the book of Genesis and, and run through 17, 18, and, and 19, um, even over as far, as far as Genesis chapter 22 in the covenant with Abraham, uh, between God and Abraham. And so last week, I, we kind of diverged a little bit here and there, um, but let's, so we're going to kind of just maybe recap just a little bit, try to, try to retap the, the main line here. And get back, on, get back on the main trail. Amen. So, um, <clears throat> let's go, if we will, uh, over to the 15th chapter of the book of Genesis. Hallelujah. I know we're going to cover some stuff we covered last week, but it will cover it lightly um, so that we can move forward. Nathan, is that my cup or your cup from the office? All right. Yes, he is now. He backwashed. That's right. Hallelujah. Talked about how that God promised Abraham in the 15th chapter of the book of Genesis. Um, you know, he appeared to him and said, I'm, I'm your exceeding reward. And then uh, God tells him in verse 4, he's going to give him a son. In verse 7, he tells him he's going to give him land to inherit. And then in verse 9 through 18, uh, we have the part where God comes down. And let's, let's go ahead and, and um, talk about that where, God, where Abraham took the, the different animals, the doves, and the turtle doves, the ram, the goat, split them and, 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 then, you know, and, and set them on two sides. And, of course, the blood ran in the middle. And then he fell into a deep sleep. And when he fell into a deep sleep, a smoking furnace, God walked down through the midst of that blood. Okay? <clears throat> well, let me read it. Here we go. And he said, take a heifer of three years old, she go to three years, verse 9. Uh, a ram of three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. He took them all, divided them in the midst, and laid each one against the other, but the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And lo, a horror of great darkness fell on him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs. They shall serve them, and they shall, be afflict, they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they that shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass. Now think about this now. How many of you have ever heard the, the teachings that a Jewish generation is 44 years? And that kind of thing. They didn't see the budding of the fig tree. We'll see the return of Jesus. And that Israel became a nation again in 48. And 44 years was 92. Well, we're way past 92. <clears throat> Here God says... That they're going to be there for 400 years and in the fourth generation. Now, I'm not, I don't know, I'm not being real dogmatic here, but it sounds like God was saying the generation was 100 years. That's what it sounds like. So sometimes, you know, we see we get, people get, try to get real tricky with numbers and start speaking stuff. How many remember, not, you know, that Jesus was coming back on Rosh Hashanah, the September 7th, 8th, and 9th, 1988? How many remember the book? God made millions, sold millions of books. You know, or a million books or whatever on why Jesus is coming back on Rosh Hashanah, uh, September 7th, 8th, and 9th of 1988. Guess what? People sold their houses, quit their jobs, went up and stood on mountains waiting for Jesus to come back. He didn't come. 
And so the guy wrote a sequel called 89 Reasons Jesus is Coming Back on Rosh Hashanah 1989. You know, the 80, this is no joke. The 89th reason was he didn't come in 88. And you listen, the people went out and bought the book again. You didn't have to buy the book. You know, all you had to do was write, they take, write, take a pencil piece of paper and go on the bottom, right? He didn't come in 88. And you had the new book. <coughs> Be careful making this concrete. You know, there, are, you know, there are signs of the times that we can look at and say it, we're, it's getting close. <coughs> Watch out when people start predicting. This. How many remember the guy a couple years ago? He's coming in March of, of whatever year it was, and then six months later, and, you know, and he was, you know, and, and of course, he's totally discredited now. Because that's the, that's the third or fourth time he's predicted the exact date Jesus is coming back. Yeah, had a billboard over the city, that's right. You know, last time I looked, Jesus said, no man knows the day or the hour. Now, if Jesus said, no man knows the day or the hour, guess what? Nobody knows. God knows, but you don't know. Amen? Why didn't he tell anybody? Because everybody would do this. Let me tell you, if everybody knew Jesus was coming back on December 31st at 11.58, and they knew it for a fact, do you know what would happen? Party. Everybody would party hardy up to 11.56. <laughs> yeah. And they'd all get saved at 11.56 and go out at 11.58 or whatever. That's human nature. That's how people do but you know, the Bible teaches us to be like the, like the wise virgin. Remember the parable? I don't know why I'm over here. Well, praise the Lord. You know the, the parable of the, of the virgins? The ten virgins? Five of them were wise, five of them weren't too swift. You know, they, they, they didn't carry any extra oil. They let the lamps burn out. And the only ones that carried extra oil, why? So they were prepared. You know, we're to, you know, we're to live prepared. Amen? Amen? See, you know, dead, deadline, listen, I've, got, I've, got, I've had college kids. Now, Nathan's probably the worst of this in any of them. Nathan lives, he, he may know the beginning of, of day one of a class that something's due on last day of class. He'll wait to night before last day of class to do it. Just, I mean, wait to, right up to the last possible second. Had three months. Going to pull it off at the last second. And he's pulled it off, that's right. A couple times he's got it pulled off with us dragging him across the line. Yeah. Or kicking him across the line, one of the two. Which was it, buddy? Or both? Yeah, both of them. That's right. So people like to, they just think it's just something about people, but sometimes they'll just want to wait. So you had the five smart versions, but they carried extra. They were, and so while the five foolish versions were gone away to get more oil, the master came, or the bridegroom came. And the other came, and they got left out. So we want to be ready. Now, Dad Hagen had a great saying. Amen? He said this, plan like Jesus isn't coming back for 50 years. Live like he's coming back any second. Amen. You make your plans. See, you got people who, just like Rosh, Jesus coming back on Rosh Hashanah, they sell their houses, quit their jobs, quit all their business, give all the stuff away, and go stand on a mountain. And then when he didn't come back, they're in trouble. Amen. They're in a heap of trouble. They don't have a job, they don't have a house, they don't have any money. No, you plan like he's not coming back for 50 years. You live like he's coming back any second. What do you mean you live like he's coming back any second? You live, you live holy, you live pure, you live separated. All right, well, anyway, let's get out of that because that's not where we're going. Hallelujah. And so God came down and walked, a smoking furnace, man, that heart, that dark came over him. And um, hallelujah. And it came to pass that when the sun went down, uh, and it was dark. Behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, Abram, saying, unto, the, uh, unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates. Now, let me say something. I don't really care what you think. Israel is God's land for his people. Well, the Palestinians need a place. There's lots of places that God gave that to the Jews. Well, who does he think he is? God. God can give it who he wants to give it to. And he said it was for his covenant people. And let me tell you, it was never Palestinian until the 1935 pact between, uh, between England, the Brits, and something else. They created that Palestinian thing. That was some kind of weird political thing that they did. So don't, don't get all caught up in all that stuff. It's God's land. It's God's people's land. There, there is no two nation settlement 
to, the, to this. I don't, I won't go over here. The, the anti-Israelite, the Ishmaels, have one purpose, no Israel. The, how many of you ever heard of the Dome of the Rock? The big Muslim thing in Jerusalem. Now, why do you think, why did they build it where they built it? Because they thought it was the original temple site of the Jewish temple. And they knew that the prophecy said that the temple would be rebuilt and Jesus would come back. So they built the Dome of the Rock on what they thought was the old Temple Mount site. And inside, Joe Morris, one of my friends, and he comes here sometimes, has been there. And on the inside in Arabic, written all around in circle, right, all the way in the dome, round and round and round and round until it runs out. It says, there is no Son of God, 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 there is no Son of God. The eastern gate is up there, and they, it's on that property that they have. And so they bricked up the eastern gate. Now, let's be real, folks. If Jesus is the Son of God, and he shows up, do you think your brick going to keep him out? I mean, really. That shows you how dumb they are. We're going to break it up. He can't get through it. Son of God, manifest in flesh, shows up in the middle of the room. And the Bible has already showed up a couple times where they were all together, and the doors are shut, and he walks out and just shows up in the middle of them. Hello? And you think a brick wall is going to keep him out? See, that's stupidity on steroids. The, the, cute, the funny thing is, 300 feet away from the Dome of the Rock, they found the foundations to the original temple. It's not where the Dome of the Rock is. They messed up. The temple will be rebuilt. Jerusalem is the city of peace. It is God's city. Hallelujah. The priesthood will be restored. Jesus will come back. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Israel is the land of God's natural seed of Abraham. Amen. It belongs to them. By covenant right. Y'all hear you go home. All right, let's, let's move on here. So God walked between the pieces and the blood of the animals. And then we move over a couple chapters and then God comes in and changes his name. Genesis, you know, no more sure your name be called Abraham. You should be called Abraham over in chapter 17. Abraham and a father of a prince of peace and father of nations. I mean, really a father of a multitude. Now, can you imagine Abe? He's 90 and 9 when this shows, so 99 when this happens. And he goes down to the city gate. Now, back in those days, everybody went to the city gate. The elders went to the city gate and they talked. It was kind of a, it was the, uh, the social, it was the Facebook of the day. All right? It was a Twitter of the day. You showed up at the city gate and talked face to face. Unlike now, you talk, you know, talk anyway. We talk in electronic bits and bytes of data that are translated over you know, electronic airwaves to somebody else. Uh, anyway, but you know, Abram shows up one day, and he's Abram. Next day he shows up, and he says, hey, God showed up last night and changed my name. What did he change it to? Abraham. Can you imagine when they heard him say, I'm now the father of many nations, and they've seen his wife? Now, I don't mean to be ugly, but Sarah was, 90, was, was, was 89 when this happened. Even Guinness wouldn't put her in there. Book of World Records. No artificial insemination. Nothing. I mean, Abram's got a wife that's 89. He's 99. What would you think if you went to the mall this weekend and saw an 89-year-old woman pushing a baby carriage and a 99-year-old man walking beside her holding hands and, and, and you would think, oh, that's a great, 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 great grandbaby. And you say, oh, is that your great, great, or great, 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 great grandbaby? They say, she'd say, that's my baby. I have Jeff giving running commentary over here. The color announcer, you know. You, know. you, got, you always have the guy give the play-by-play, -play, then you got the color announcer over there going. And, you know, J thank you, Jeff. I bet ESPN's looking for you. You got a job waiting on you. <clears throat> well, let's just back up a few months. I go to the mall, you walk by, and you see a 99-year-old woman walking, or 89-year-old woman walking around with a big belly. And you think, oh, Lord, she's got a tumor. Are you going in for operation for that? What are you talking about? That tumor. That's not a tumor, that's a baby. Is that safe for you to do artificial insemination at that age? That's what you, people would think anything other than she got pregnant. But God said, 
to Abram. Abram, you have changed your name to the father of many nations. Oh, now I'm going to change Sarah's name. And she's going to be called the mother of many nations. She was Sarah, and now she's Sarah. People start calling them, talking to them, and calling them father and mother of many nations. At that age. Hello? That's a covenant promise. A year later, that she had the baby. Everybody stopped laughing. Amen? And in Genesis, the 17th chapter, and the 10th verse, now remember God walked in the blood in chapter 15. Gen Abraham, the the, the uh, circumcision was, uh, was performed, and Abraham's blood was shared, and they were now in blood covenant, the most binding, forceful covenant there is. Now, in throughout this, pa this passage of Scripture from 15 through 18 and so forth, uh, the chapters, you need to read those. God gave Abraham land, a son, fruitfulness, in other words, the promise of fruitfulness to be father of many nations, and counted Abraham as a friend, James 3, 23, 2, 23, and 2 Chronicles 27 refer to Abraham as the friend of God. Now, just real quick so you understand this, the phrase friend of God in, in Western thought, we, we don't get what it means, but in Eastern thought, the, that, that terminology friend was a, a reference to covenant. It really means that Abraham was the blood covenant partner of God. See, a lot of times, this, this, I don't mean we go back and get real Eastern and everything, but we do need to study some things and find out what certain phrases implied so we understand them. So Abraham being referred to as a friend of God was not his buddy. Abraham was the blood covenant partner of God. Now, blood covenant is, is a stronger relationship than even naturally born brothers or sisters because they by choice dis determined to allow blood to flow between the two and come into blood covenant one with the other. Um, if, if, you'll ever, if you'll go read the book uh, Blood Covenant by H. Clay Trumbull, down here, you'll just, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not exciting reading, just, just so you'll know. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a semi-decently thick book, and it covers the travels of Stanley and Livington across Africa and all the covenants they cut. And um, now one of, the, one of the misperceptions that Trumbull had in all that, or not Trumbull, but, but, but uh, Livingston and those guys had in the travels were, they, they thought that, they, they had, that those guys had diminished the sacrament of the Eucharist, the, you know, communion with the Lord. And they didn't understand that blood covenant had gone all the way back to, to, Abram, to Abram, to Adam. And, but the, the, they studied the, the blood covenant rites of the tribal, tribals, tribal people in Africa, um, he was strong. Say if, Cap, say if Caps here made a covenant with Bill, and then Caps went out and broke the covenant, Bill's, Bill's family wouldn't have to hunt Cap down and kill him. Cap's own family would do it because they broke a covenant. You couldn't break a covenant. It was a violation. It was a violation of a very strong and binding uh, thing. That came because, you know, understand, a lot of things we do in, do in, 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 in cultures and stuff are watered-down versions of what God originally intended, and people lost the reason why it happened. The reason covenant is so strong is because it was strong with God. Uh, the word covenant, Greek, means to cut where the blood flows. Amen. So we're, we're, you know, we have here God coming into covenant with Abraham, walking through the midst of the animals. Abraham was circumcised to shed his blood. And uh, now, how do you remember when Abraham... Um, um, I believe, I believe it was Abraham or Moses. Which, which one had their son and they didn't circumcise him? And the, Moses had the son, didn't circumcise him, and the angel came, was going to kill him. Oh, that's not nice. He was out of covenant. And the mother took, and, and circumcised him on the spot and, and, and kind of got ticked off with her husband because she was about to lose her son because he had not fulfilled the covenant. He was violating the covenant. I tell you, God takes covenant serious. This ought, to help. this ought to be a blessing to you because when you understand that we're in a covenant with God through Jesus Christ, God takes covenant serious. It's not, it's not a light thing with him. Are you here? Glory to God. And so, um, so God gave Abraham land. He gave him a son. He gave him you know, a fruitfulness to be a father of many nations, counting him as a friend, a blood covenant partner. And then we have in Genesis 22 the story of Abraham and Isaac going up in the mount. Let's read that real quick. Some of this stuff is going to be informational until we get to where we need to get to, which will be probably next week. Sorry, we have to, but you, you just can't skip stuff and not cover it because it won't be exciting this week. It's like a season of 24. This week's real intense. Next week is backstory. 
Now, the new, the new show coming out in May is going to be all exciting and no backstory. It's going to be 12. Thank you, Janice. Thank you, Jaheen's mom. She said, they used to be Janice and Jerry. Now they're Jaheen's mom and dad. Going to a restaurant and they don't have him with them. Where's Jaheen? We don't, we don't care if y'all are here. We just want to know where he is. I called Jaheen last night. Janice and Jerry's son, he, he, he went, he didn't know how to respond to that. <laughs> Genesis chapter 22, verse 1 through 12. came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said, or, or, or put him to the test. Listen, covenants are of no force unless each party is willing to do their half. This is, Lord Jesus, here I go again. Done, I already feel the spirit of meddling coming on me. This is where people take things like the message of grace and miss the mark with it. See, God's done a part, but there is a man side to things. And if you don't walk in the manward side, you can't walk in the Godward side. Amen. They'll take the truth of what God has done and make it applicable to both sides, and it doesn't work that way. Here God did tempt or put Abraham to the test. Why? To make sure the covenant was a force. Because if, if Abraham, and understand this. He said, uh, Abraham, he said, I'm here. He said, take now thy son, thy only son, whom thou lovest, and um, get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains that I'll tell you of. Now think about this. He's a blood covenant partner with God. And in blood covenant, you will not withhold anything that the other partner asks of you. And God demands the one thing that Abraham would not have wanted to give up. His son. He waited, 20, he waited 100 years, really, to get that son. Tried, tried the Ishmael method. That didn't work. Hello? Hello? Finally gets the boy at 100 years old. Sarah's 90 years old. And now when Isaac's about 13, God shows up and says, go sacrifice him. And hey, listen, do you, we don't see one word about Abraham arguing. Why? He's a covenant partner of God. When you understand, God had already said that Isaac shall thy seed be. Abraham knew if God says sacrifice him, God was going to have to raise him from the dead. And the book of Romans tells us this. He had already received him raised from the dead in a figure before he ever went up on that mountain. He knew God, see, when you understand God, that no matter what, I'm telling you, folks, can I, can I say something? About two and a half, three weeks ago, we were so close to having to shut the doors and declare bankruptcy that uh, you couldn't, I mean, you could smell, you could smell it. I'm talking personally and church. And in just a matter of days, I said, what were you going to do? All I could do was say, trust God. God had to come through. I told the Lord, I said, you called us, you said here. I said, so either, either you put us over or we just shut the doors and go home. There's nothing I can do. There's nothing I can do to fix it. I can't go out and get a job enough, quick enough to make enough money to cover this and do this. I can't do a thing about it. So if it's going to get done, you're going to have to do it. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, we're not completely done with everything, but you know what? We're caught up. Hallelujah. Can I, can I share? We weren't even going to have Christmas. Our, fam our, our family wasn't going to have Christmas. Just, that's just the way it was. There wasn't any money. We were juggling everything. I mean, we were juggling everything. And then just like that, I mean, God moved on people. Things happened. More's coming. I'm telling you, when you trust God, and let me tell you, listen, I won't always, woo, didn't get out of bed and dance and the God's beating my knee. I'm in there, Lord, you got to do something, and I can't do it. So I'm putting in, you know, I, I was having a battle. I was having to fight the good fight of faith and keep my mind down and shut my mind down because my mind was going, boy, you in trouble now. Hello. Go, go down and look, go, go down and see if you can rent a mobile home somewhere. Figure out how much gas it'll cost you to drive back and forth from your, your, your wife's family's cabin in the mountains 
every Sunday to preach on. See if you can get enough money to do that. Go live in the cabin. I mean, you know, laying in bed at night is tough. You have to shut your mind down so you can go to sleep. Amen. But let me say something. God is the God of covenant. And God said, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. Amen. Hallelujah. And God comes right, right in the middle of all that stuff. And, and Kevin comes and says, a new anointing for a new harvest. You know, and, we're, and I'm sitting there thinking, dear God, we got all this. I mean, your brain's going, you think we got all this debt. We're so far behind on the lease that, that at any moment they can just come in and say, you got 30 days to get all your stuff out. At any moment. Actually, technically, they should have already done it. That's, we were so far behind, you know, they don't, they don't normally let you go three and a half months behind. Hello? Three and a half months behind, they're not even talking to you about it. They ain't saying anything. I think he was just, he was, he was just kind of letting it lie. Not telling, he may not have been telling his boss. <laughs> I don't know what was going on, but, you know, God was working. And right in the, when it was the darkest it could possibly be, things break loose. We're not done. I said, we're not done. I'm, I'm just envisioning everything. I, I, I'm now seeing. See, see sometimes God will jump starts you. You're, you're, you're fighting with everything you've got to fight. Remember, Abraham's in a covenant. I'm talking, I'm, I'm, talking, I'm giving you an, an idea of what's going on here. When you understand that God will do what he, God said he will do, and you're, 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 we struggle sometimes. Your mind will give you a fit. Your mind will talk to you, call you stupid, call you dumb, say, what you going to do now? You're going under. I mean, you'll start singing that song. Remember that song the Raymond Singers and the man used to sing? We are not going under. We're going over. And all of a sudden, you're laying in bed and going, We're not going over. We're going. And that starts going through your head, and you're going, No! <laughs> can't, you, can't, you can't give in to it. And all, the, and all that stuff coming. But you see, God is God. Amen. And God doesn't change. Amen. And God doesn't always pay up on Saturday, but he pays up, glory to God. And God doesn't come through always when you think he should, but he always comes through. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Amen. He always has the answer when you need the answer, glory to God. Yeah. It was as dark as it could get. But on the horizon, the light shines. Hallelujah, Hallelujah. glory to God. Amen. Glory. To God. <laughs> glory. <clears throat> Glory. I'm still in my teenage years. My voice is still changing. Hallelujah. So right in the middle of the, of the darkest it could be. So here we have Abraham. It's got to be the darkest it could be. Here he is. God finally gave him the son. Then he says, no, go sacrifice him. But he has to know that God promised him that Isaac would be the one that the seed would come through. So somehow or another, even if he sacrifices him, God's got to raise him up from the dead. Because <clears throat> God can't lie. God may have to raise your vision up from the dead. God may have to raise your business up from the dead. God may have to raise up your marriage from the dead. God may have to raise up whatever, the, you know, your, your job employment situation up from the dead. But God is the God of resurrection and life. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And so, <clears throat> he says... <clears throat> Uh, go, go to the mountain, I'll tell you, verse 3, and Abraham rose up, earth, didn't wait, didn't lay in bed, didn't kind of try to put it off, didn't pull the covers up over his head and say, oh, can I just delay this a little bit longer? He says, he rose up early in the morning, saddled his ass, and took with him his young men with, with him, and Isaac his son, and a clave of wood for the burnt offering, and rose up, went to the place of which God had told him. And on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to the young men, abide ye here. Listen to this verse. Abide ye here with the, the young men, uh, he said to his young man, Abide you here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again unto you. Now, Abraham knows he's going to sacrifice Isaac, but he tells them we're coming back. See, he knows God's got to do something. He knows he has to obey God. When we obey God, we don't always know what we're going to face in that, that time of obedience, but we do know the outcome. Amen? Amen? See, we got a lot of people trying to, trying to make the outcome work for them without walking through the place of obedience. Oh, 
I'm letting you think about it for a minute. <coughs> are you here? There are times God's going to come. Now, God won't do that. Oh, yes, he does. God calls you to a place of obedience. God wants to know if you're going to do what he said he would do. Amen. Are you going to stay when he said stay and you didn't want to stay? Are you going to see through the difficult times? Listen, I know too many people who've packed up and quit their ministries and their churches because it got too tough in one place or here or there. Something went wrong and they quit. I'm telling you, God wants to know if you've got some stick to it this. He wants to know if you can stick it out. Well, I'll tell you what, I, I, there are times I wish I could have quit. I even offered to turn in my resignation. You know, you want to walk in like the guy on the top gun and throw your wings on the desk and say, I resign my commission. <clears throat> you could do that. But see, God, God doesn't take that. He don't, he, don't, he don't accept your resignation. Did you know the gifts and callings of God are without repentance? What's that mean? If he, got, if he called you, he called you, and that's just the way it is. I'm excited because I know in the days ahead of us, we're going to see people restored to their callings. We're going to see people restored to what God set them to do. We're going to see people who, who are floundering, stop floundering, get back, get back in the game. I know it's coming. I know it's coming. Because there's, there's a big job to do. Hallelujah. And, you know, in, in the gifts and callings of repentance, people got to fulfill their destinies. Amen. I said amen. We're, I'm going to see it. I want to see it. I look longing to see it. Glory to God. There's just, just too much to get done. God will restore people to our place, and God will bring new people to our place. It's a new anointing for a new harvest. Amen. Hallelujah. So I'm the, yon, I'm the ladder going to go yonder and worship and come again to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it upon Isaac his son. He took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they both went together. <coughs> Isaac spake to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, um, I'm going to paraphrase this a little bit. Dad! Yep. I got the fire, the wood. Where's the lamb? For the burnt offering. And he's, starting to, he's kind of looking at the thing going, Okay, there's wood, there's fire, there's no offering. Now Abraham's sitting over here going, you be the offering. Hello? And Abraham says this, another, this, is a, this is kind of one of those type things. My son, God will provide, provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. Another, another statement of faith. And they came to the place which God had told them of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order, and then he comes over to Isaac with rope. Now, you know, Isaac's got to be thinking about this time. This ain't going well. I mean, really, this is not going well. And uh, he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Now, this, you've got to, if, you're, if, you're, if you're Isaac, if you're Nathan and I'm dad and I got you on, the, on top of the wood with a fire and a knife, you're probably thinking this is not a good day for me. Hello? And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And remember, he's doing this in obedience to God because God's already told him Isaac will the seed be called. He knows that when he slays him and burns him, God's going to take those ashes and raise him up from the dead. He knows it has to be. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He's thinking, Shoo, here am I. He said, lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him, for thou knowest that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. <coughs> and Abraham called the place Jehovah Jireh, or the Lord will provide, the Lord I provide, really is Jehovah Yireh. Um, is that place, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will see, or the Lord will provide. Jehovah Jireh, my provider, that's where we get it from, right here. God will provide. Amen? As it is said this day in that mount. Listen to what happened. Now, remember, we're in covenant. We're in a covenant. God's ultimate plan. Remember, Jesus is the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. Isn't that what the Bible, isn't that what the Bible says? 
slain from the foundation of the world. God's plan is to, is to, to, to send his son incarnate in flesh and sacrifice it for the sins of the world. But it has to be done through covenant. <clears throat> And the angel of the Lord cried out to Abraham a second time. He said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and not withheld thy son, thine only son. Now what had he done? He had opened the door for God to send his son in covenant response to the fact that Abraham withheld not his son. God's now going to send his son. Amen. This act of obedience opened the door for redemption. I am telling you people, I don't care what extreme nuts cases say. Obedience is a plan is part of the plan of God in your life to sow seed to open the door for great miracles. Great miracles are not going to come just because you lay down and look at the finished work of Jesus. I don't care what anybody preaches. The biblical principles, Abraham was the, was the father of our faith, and we're to follow the faith of our father Abraham, and we're to be, have the kind of faith that Abraham had, and Abraham, remember Jesus was obedient even unto the death of the cross, and we're to be like Jesus. I'm telling you, it's all through the Bible. We're in covenant with God, and when God tells you to do something, there's a reason. God doesn't require obedience of you so he can make you uh, suffer. God is requiring obedience of you to sow seed so he can respond in like kind, but greater. Are you here? We got, so we got, some, we got so many people trying to preach stuff that, uh, that absolves everybody of any responsibility in life because we live in a generation of lazy people. We really do. We don't want commitment. We don't believe in commitment. How many know that 20 years ago, a good Hollywood marriage was seven years? Now, if it makes it seven hours, it's a miracle. Hello? But people, people now, they live together for seven years before they think about getting married. You know? And we, we make our, our movies are all about, you know, it's all about, you know, uh, getting married after you have the baby. It's about, you know, you've been married for seven years, and, you know, and, you, you know, and, and, one day, and finally they're going to ask me to marry them. See, let me say that. Girls, all, women have in them, they want to get married. There's just something in women that want the security of that. There's something that God created in them. And then the men want, you know, man, like I saw some movie recently, and the, and the guy, you know, was going to ask her to move in with him. He says, look, I'm really stepping out here, honey. Really? No commitment. Your commitment is you can live together? You know what you want? Well, I ain't going to say what you want. You know what you want. I, I can't say it. <laughs> you want the benefits without, the, without paying for it. You want all the bennies, but you don't want to have to pay, you, want, you don't have to support it. You want to be able to go to bed and do, and, and have your, and do your thing. And have Nathan do his cover of, let's get it on. All right. How do you recover from that? You want the benefits of a covenant without coming into covenant. You want the blessing without the responsibility. That is the mindset of our culture now. We want freedom. We don't want to fight for it. Hello? We want protection without upholding our Constitution. We want money and don't have to work for it. We want somebody else to take care of us. Hello? Without any responsibility. That is the mindset of our world. We've been together seven years. Are you married? No. Oh, no. We're beyond that. 
You're beyond that until he or she sees someone else that turns them on more. So you're willing to make a covenant agreement and come into covenant? No benefits without covenant. Because they are the benefits of the covenant. That went over big. Oh, yo, prude. Yeah. Go ahead. Be stupid. You got a pregnant. We're just having an abortion. Oh, now you're going to compound. You're going to go kill a baby. That's just fetal tissue. You go, go, go talk to God about that one. Let's, let's see you stand up before God and tell him it's fetal tissue. Well, I don't really believe. Well, that's your problem. You don't, you don't have the moral, you don't operate in the moral code. Right. You just want to be flesh. You're not flesh. You're a spirit. You have a soul. You live in a body. Your real you is a, is a spirit being created, by the, created in the image of God. And God demands certain things out of that spirit being. One of them is for that spirit being to control that flesh. Go ahead, shoot me. Amen. Now, we're in, marriage is a covenant. That's why you can't have homosexual marriage. There's no such thing as homosexual marriage. You can't have a covenant. I don't care what they say. I don't care what law they pass. Before God Almighty, it is not marriage. Because the two cannot become one flesh. It is an abomination. God says he turns them over to a reprobate mind, book of Romans. Jesus didn't say anything about he don't he didn't say anything about pedophilia either. That didn't make it that make pedophilia right. We are in a covenant. You see, I know I know we're kind of digress, but you gotta understand people get over into the, these areas of life, they think that they're gonna get all the benefits without operating in the responsibility and obedience to the covenant, and it doesn't work. We were in a covenant. And when we came in the covenant, we made, a, a, we made obligatory, obligatory, did I get that right? I think so, yeah. Okay, commitments. What was your obligation? You called him Lord. You came into obedience to whatever he said by calling him Lord. Whosoever shall call him, say that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God's raised from the dead shall be saved. We came into a place where we, we submitted to his lordship over our life. Meaning we do what he says do. In return, we got born again. Hello? We got promises of help and healing and prosperity and redemption. Glory to God. We walk in obedience and submission to his will. You violate that and you, you thwart the ability of the Lord to provide his end of the covenant because you're not walking in yours. Now, he made provision for you when you did do that. It's called the throne of grace. You come and you repent and you thank God for forgiveness. And he washes you clean. The blood of Jesus washes you clean from it. I don't care what anybody says. First John 1, 9 belongs to the church. It is to the church. And it is for you to rid you of things that are thwarting your acts of disobedience so that you can walk in obedience, so that you can walk in your part of the covenant. Yeah, move forward. Amen. You're not earning anything. You're just walking in obedience to what God said to you because God's going to do certain things in response to your obedience. Yeah. Yeah. He said he would. And Abraham obeyed God and took Isaac to the mount to slay him. And God said, because you did this thing, you withheld not your son. And because you didn't withhold your son, he said this. That in blessing I will bless you, and in multiplying I will multiply you as the stars of the heaven. And the sand of the seashore, which is upon the, um, uh, the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemy. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Because thou hast obeyed my voice. That's the Old Testament. It's Old Testament promise, and the Bible says, folks, be good students of the Bible. Don't let somebody that's cute and got a cute little television program or whatever and does little cute things on their television programs or they got really high-tech stuff thwart your ability to understand Scripture, especially when they don't use a lot of it themselves. 
Does not Galatians say, if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise? There is a direct correlation between the actions of Abraham and him receiving the promise and the actions of the church and them receiving the promise. It is a pattern for the church. And God said, because you obeyed my voice. Isn't that what he said? Mm -hmm. Because you obeyed my voice, this is what's going to happen. We had, Isaiah 119, that's Old I don't care if it's Old Testament, it's still a good Bible. If you be willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. He talks about attitude and action in that one. You've got to have the right heart and the right action. Obedience doesn't earn God's favor. Amen? It doesn't earn it, but it releases it. The favor has already made provision for obedience releases it. What do you mean obedience? Doing what God said. Now listen, if God tells you, that like Greg, Greg's got a business, he sells furniture, or they manufacture and they're, they're, they're the wholesale end. Mm -hmm. The manufacturing wholesale end, okay? They're not the retail end, technically. Right. Yep. Okay? Greg, I want you to... Um, I want you to triple your line next year, and I'll make you rich in three years. Okay. And Greg sits around and goes, God's going to make me rich in three years. God's going to make me rich in three years. Doesn't triple his line. He lays down. Somebody says, what are you doing, Greg? I'm looking at the finished work of Jesus because he's going to make me rich in three years. He's going to make me rich in three years. I'm just going to look at the finish. Jesus went to the cross. Paid. I don't have to do anything. He's going to make me rich in three years. Guess what's going to happen in three years? He's going to be right where he is right now. Or further behind. Why? Because he, he didn't, God said, if you do this, you didn't obey. So if God tells you to do something, you have to obey it. Now that's a specific word, but what about the written words? We're talking about covenant. Is it really after 12? I done got it going and got the long wind spirit back. It came back, and it went out in dry places, and it came back with seven more worse than the first. <laughs> Woo, we're going to be here for a long time. Think about the fact that we are in covenant with God, Abraham, because he obeyed the voice of God. God said, because you obeyed my voice, I'm going to do such and such. Greg, God spoke to Greg, hypothetically speaking. Mm -hmm. Do this, and in three years I'll make you rich. Unless Greg does what God said right. do, then the hour of three years make you rich doesn't apply. Right. Good. No, but we're under grace. God's not a favor for it. He'll do whatever. Wait a second. God said do something. He's not earning the richness by obeying. God's saying this is what you do to get that. Obey me. Not earning it. But he can't lay down and not do what God said do and get it. Can you imagine a football team going out and having that mindset in the natural? They walk out on the field and they lay down. We win. Why? Because we're looking at the finished work of Jesus. The other team's going to pick the ball up, run down the other end, and score a touchdown. And they don't have to do anything else the rest of the game. Why? Because the other team's just laying down. They're not doing you got, we have, Obeying is doing what God said to do. Now, let me say, that was a specific word for Greg, so, so to speak. But what about when we get a, new, a, a Bible scripture that says, you know, um, give and it shall be given unto you. And then you run around claiming prosperity no matter what you do because, you know, you're living under the grace of God. Yet the word of God says give. You have to obey. In, order, in other words, for the covenant to operate for you, you have to obey what the covenant says to do. Otherwise, you're living. Oh, brother. Just slap me right there. No, I'm not going to. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going obey. To. Sit down. <laughs> Nathan's coming, boy. I'm going to pop him one. I'll be sitting in the front seat, and I, I get these things, I call them hiccup burps. You got help, help. 
You're kind of burping and hiccup at yeah. the same time. And if Nathan's behind me, I'll be sitting there kind of ride down the road, and all of a sudden something goes, pop! And I'm like, who can He said, you stopped, didn't you? <coughs> he loves to pop me when I'm doing that, because it gives it, you know, it's, it's, a free, it's a free pass. If you think you're going to reap the benefits of the covenant without obedience to the covenant, you are living in spiritual fornication. I told you, I was, that's why I was going to slap me, because it's going to start. Yeah, here it comes. That's good. You're, you're trying to get the benefits without functioning in the covenant. Yeah. It's good. <laughs> Say it again, Pastor. I said that if you think, if you're going to try to get the benefits of the covenant without walking in obedience to the covenant, you're living in spiritual fornication. Yeah, that's good. Negative truth. <laughs> Just like a man and woman have to come together in covenant, biblically, in order to engage in, in relate marital relations, marital relations. Try not to be too crude. I could get cruder, but I'm not going to. We have younger people in, so we're trying to keep this PG-13, as PG as we can. We've got people, see, see that mindset the world creeps into the church, and then we start using, applying those things to spiritual things. And so we're trying to get the benefits of being in, in the spiritual, marital covenant with God. I'm just using allegories here. Uh -huh. Get all the benefits without any responsibility on our side of the covenant. It doesn't work. I said it doesn't work. Abraham got the blessing because God said, you obeyed mm. my voice. And if you want to walk in the blessing, you're going to have to obey God. Well, listen, well, God didn't speak to me. It's full of him speaking to you. It's all through there. Yeah, yeah. It's all over the place. Are you here? There's, did you know there's over 30,000 promises in the Bible? Wow. Promises. And let me say this. Vast and beyond measure of them, they're all subsequent or all have prerequisites. Uh -huh. If ye do this, then I'll do this. How, how many like getting prosperity? Jesus said, give and it shall be given unto you. You can't run in and say, God said he's going to give it to me. Hallelujah. No, you got to give. Go to the book, I think 2 Corinthians chapter 8, is that right, Bill? 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. God said to sow. And he, listen to this. Now here's, you're talking about a, how you operate the covenant. He that sows sparingly shall reap sparingly. Yeah. He that soweth bountifully shall reap bountifully. Right, now right. You can, I don't care what teaching you come up with, you can't go and just change the Bible to fit your teaching. Yeah. And then he says this, every man as he purposes according to his own heart. Had nothing to do, God's, what's, what, what is it? God's prosperity is available. How you purpose to operate in it right. determines okay. what you get out of it. Yeah. If you purpose to sow sparingly, then you're going to have a sparing harvest. Yeah. If, you, if you purpose to sow bountifully, you're going to have a bountiful harvest. Because then the scripture goes on and says, every man according as he purposes in his own heart. His heart. Not God's going to bless you no matter what you do, as you purposed in your heart to sow. Amen. What? Sowing was in obedience to the command of God. Bring the tithe and offering into the storehouse. We're to bless the kingdom financially, time-wise, uh, talent-wise, all kinds of, but also financially. And if anybody's teaching you, you're going to prosper no matter what you do. They're teaching you error. They're teaching you spiritual fornication. I know that's strong. But it's time we use strong terms against dumb teaching. You might want to title this Spiritual Fornication, Bill. Everybody's going, that's right. We'll have, we'll have 150 people here next week waiting to get in. They're, they're coming in to find out what's going on in that church. Amen. 
See, obedience, obedience is what brought Abraham the blessing. Go to, um, I'm not sure if it's Romans, Romans 12 or Hebrews 12. Learn obedience even through the death of the cross. Anybody know where that is right off? Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, 2. Now I'm looking for the, I'm looking, there's a, there's a, the term obedience. Okay. Hebrews 5, 8. Though he were a son. How many are, how many, woo, we're sons and daughters of God. Yet he learned obedience to the things which he suffered. Now, let me say this. He endured the shame. Wait, hold on now. He was obedient, suffered things. But remember what the Bible says when he was on the cross? Who for the joy that was set before him endured the shame of the cross. See, the reward came through obedience. The reward of redeeming humanity came through obedience. Mm -hmm. Now, that, a lot, there's a lot of people who don't want to teach that. Because they all go to the happy, clappy church. Hula hoops on Sunday morning. Christian beach music and sunglasses. Woo! Glory to God. I love, I love a good time too. But there's things we can't circumvent in the Bible. If you're going to walk in the blessing, you're going to walk in obedience. When God says do something, you do what God says do. Amen? It's just like the couple that came to one of my pastors and, um, that, I, that I, I'm the director over. And, and, and understand there's a term not of, of authority. I'm over you. It's just it's, it's the, it's the hierarchy of how it's set up. And, I, and I'm, not, I'm not some great, great. God positioned me to be a liaison between Raymond and our pastors. And so, but one of, our, one of the pastors that I have, a couple came in his office. I know I've told you this, but I'll tell you again. Came in his office one day and they were having couple count, for couple counseling. We don't go marriage counseling, but we get couple counseling. And after a few minutes talking, he figured out they're living together. And so he said, "Yeah, I, guys, I got your, I, I've got your, I know what's wrong with y'all's you know, relationship. Oh, great. He said, you're living in sin. You're living in fornication. You're not married. Oh, no, pastor. We're under grace. That don't matter. Well, if you're under that much grace, why are you having problems? <laughs> yeah. I mean, if that grace is working so good for you that you can live together and don't matter, why are you having problems? You're having problems because you're violating the Word of God. You're not in obedience to the Word of God. You're trying to get the benefits without living in obedience. Lord, we thank you for the Word. Thank you that it's good. Thank you that you're, you're working in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right.